I'm very glad to be joined today by Matt Des, foreign policy advisor to Bernie Sanders, independent senator from Vermont. Welcome to the show, Matt. Very glad to be here. Thank you. Okay, so we're talking about what everyone's talking about uh, with respect to foreign policy right now, which is the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. I know there's been a lot of commentary Mm -hmm. about this, but my feeling often is that the way that foreign policy in particular is talked about excludes a lot of folks from the conversation who haven't been following it for a long time. And I want this to kind of be baby's first Ukrainian episode. Mm. Uh, So could you help set the scene of why we are in this conflict to begin with? Sure. I mean, it's always with situations like this, when you want to like uh, appreciate and respect the amount of kind of complexity and nuance, it's hard to know how far to go back. So, uh, you know, people will criticize whatever choice they make. So let's just say that it, it's clear that for many years that, that Russia and Vladimir Putin in particular have, you know, opposed kind of Ukraine's tilt toward Europe, toward the West to talk about Ukraine joining NATO. At the same time, uh, this is not something that is necessarily unique to Putin. And I think there are actually valid questions with how much this actually plays into Putin's concerns. I mean, I think he's given he wrote a a piece last year and in his rambling speech that he gave uh, just yesterday, justifying uh, the latest invasion of Ukraine, the NATO expansion. Um, And again, just for listeners, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization founded in the wake of World War Two. Um, you know, specifically as a, a U.S. Europe uh, uh, military alliance to confront and oppose Soviet expansion, and that has expanded since the collapse of the Cold War to to include a number of former Soviet countries, um, and that's been an issue for leaders beyond just Putin. I mean, American officials themselves have have acknowledged that this is a very very touchy political issue for Russians for obvious reasons. Um, but as far as wh- how big a role that plays in, in Putin's own concerns, I think it was one uh, one part, but only one part in the kind of vast sort of revisionist history that he laid out um, in the speech that he gave justifying the invasion. And, and I would encourage folks to read that speech. Actually, I think Max Fisher in The New York Times had a really good kind of analysis piece by piece of that speech because it was a pretty, you know, it's, it's not exactly shocking, but it was an, another step in terms of completely revising or or just completely denying um, Ukraine's existence as an independent state, uh, denying Ukrainian culture as a real thing, denying the Ukrainian people as a separate people, saying that this is just one civilization, which of course means a Russian-dominated civilization. Ukraine is not just a neighbor, neighboring country to us. It is an inherent part of our own history, culture, spiritual space. Since ancient times, people from ancient southwestern Russian lands were called themselves, were calling themselves Russians and Orthodox. That was happening until 17th century when part of these territories rejoined the Russian Empire, the Russian state, and after that. And we have every reason to say now that it's Ukraine created by Vladimir Lenin. He's its creator and architect. And now, grateful the sentence, demolishing all the statues, all the monuments to Lenin. They call it decommunization. You want decommunization? Well, we are quite happy with that. But don't stop halfway. We are ready to show you what would mean actual decommunization for Ukraine. Um, and, you know, there, there's more to it than this, but I would say this is the justification that Putin himself is laying out. So if you go back to 2014, you had, um, you know, in, in what is now acknowledged as a Russian invasion of eastern Ukraine, um, the, the uh, in the region known as Donbass, um, to, this is the region in eastern Ukraine that contains the two of uh, the provinces or oblasts that um, Russia do- or uh, Russian forces or Russian affiliated forces occupied since 2014. And that conflict was basically frozen until about a year ago when Russia slowly began to mass its forces on essentially three sides of Ukraine, including putting forces in Belarus, um, blockading it uh, by the sea to the south, 
um, and putting what we have now close to 170,000 Russian troops on three sides. And as of yesterday, those troops have now gone into those those regions in eastern Ukraine. Uh, the legal pretext given by uh, Putin and, and by the Russian government is that we are acting, we recognize the independence of these regions, and we are now acting on the basis of our own laws, which permits us to act in defense of Russian citizens in these end, independent regions. So that's that's where we are right now. Thank you. That's that's helpful. So my first question is, if the invasion really happened in 2014, I was reflecting on whether or not the kind of discourse we're having now about World War Three existed back then. And there was some of it, but I don't recall it being at quite the, the fever pitch it is right now. To what do you attribute that? I mean, I think it's a couple of things. One is it was a much smaller operation back then. I mean, the the presence of again, um, one hundred and seventy thousand troops and and artillery and armor tanks, et cetera, massing on the and borders. Just, and just for context, that's something yeah. like what seventy five percent of Russia's standing army. It's, it's, um, it's significant, right? It's hugely significant. That's a good question. I'm not sure of the percentage, but this is the biggest mobilization of Russian military forces that we've seen since the Afghanistan invasion back in in the late seventies. So it is very big. Um, it's the biggest one in 40 years. I think that that is very significant. Um, in 2014, the operation was different. You had what were called at the time little green men who were basically, you know, military contractors, essentially militias, which um, there's some evidence uh, are, you know, were acting at the behest under the command or at least closely associated with the Russian government. But there was at least a level of deniability. That was the whole point was um, you know, Putin decided to act in a way that there was a level of deniability about what was really happening. And of course, he's trying that to some extent now by claiming that there are Ukrainian attacks on these regions. They've used the word genocide. There's zero evidence any of that is going on. I mean, I, I think the idea that the Ukrainians would seek to provoke the Russian forces with 170,000 Russian troops massed at their border kind of beggars belief. But those are the claims that, that Putin is making. But I think this is a much, much more overt action than we saw in 2014, you know, with a much larger military force. And I think that leads to some of this rhetoric you're talking about. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the argument that there are, this is a, an area of Ukraine where there are people who have you know, cultural identity affiliation with Russia, obviously mm -hmm. the way that we do borders and do colonialism yeah. and do imperialism yeah. mean that there are all right. kinds of people living all across, all across right. different borders who have different right. affiliations like that. Yeah. And that there are separatists in the region, whether or not they're being informed, pro propagandized, boosted by Russia, who would prefer a different kind of national affiliation. Yeah. And that there, there is a who started it conversation going on between you know, whether or not you want to attribute it to the separatists throwing the first punch or Ukrainians throwing the first punch. I mean, I think what, what you said about, yeah, I mean, yes, there are there exactly as you said, in the eastern regions, there are uh, people who consider themselves uh, m perhaps more Russian than Ukrainian. They are Russian speakers. There are also people who are Russian speakers who are you know, very much a part of Ukraine, want to continue being part of Ukraine. Um, they, they speak Ukrainian as well as Russian. And, and the farther you get west, you know, the kind of I think the, the Ukrainian culture asserts itself a bit more. But as you said as well, this is not unique. I mean, we have a lot of countries around the world, borders, particularly in Europe, let's remember, borders were drawn with every few weeks uh, through, you know, the late, you know, 19th and uh, century and into the 20th. But, um, you know, the way to handle that is is obviously not through an invasion. Um, the way to do that is to promote kind of a, a pluralistic uh, democracy, a government that represents its own people all, or all of its people. Um, I would just add that using this excuse of, you know, we are acting to protect our, you know, our ethnic brothers and sisters um, is is a very familiar kind of excuse that's offered throughout history um, and, and, and rarely, uh, rarely truthfully and rarely ends up well. Yeah, I I was watching, you know, clips yesterday and I saw a Kenyan diplomat making a speech about how, you know, Africa had, was parceled by colonizers and how they're very familiar with the idea that there are countrymen, you know, uh, tribal members, whatever, on the other side of a border. And that doesn't mean you don't get to respect national right. borders. And it kind of raised some interesting kind of philosophical questions for me about whether or not we should be defending 
you know, the way that those those countries were parceled out <laughs> as opposed to, you know, interrogating the validity of borders, not necessarily obviously in a, a territorial kind of war, like yeah. imperial context, but why, right. why, you know, the investment, hearing a Kenyan man kind of invested in these colonial borders struck me as a little bit interesting. I do. I actually, I thought that speech, I know the one, I, I listened to it, I read it. It was, I think people should read it. It was very interesting. And I thought in, in, in some ways, are very on point. Today, across the border of every single African country live our countrymen with whom we share deep historical, cultural, and linguistic bonds. At independence, had we chosen to pursue states on the basis of ethnic, racial, or religious homogeneity, we would still be waging bloody wars these many decades later. Instead, we agreed that we would settle for the borders that we inherited. But we would still pursue continental political, economic, and legal integration, rather than form nations that looked ever backward into history with a dangerous nostalgia. We chose to look forward to a greatness none of our many nations and peoples had ever known. We chose to follow the rules of the Organization of African Unity and the United Nations Charter not because our border satisfied us, but because we wanted something greater forged in peace. We believe that all states formed from empires that have collapsed or retreated have many peoples in them yearning for integration with peoples in neighboring states. This is normal and understandable. After all, who does not want to be joined to their brethren and to make common purpose with them? However, Kenya rejects such a yearning from being pursued by force. We must complete our recovery from the embers of dead empires in a way that does not plunge us back into new forms of domination and oppression. The point that he, he made was, you know, listen, if we were determined to rearrange our own borders in a way that reflected just these very close tribal and ethnic ties, we would never stop fighting. And I think that's not unique uh, to Africa. I mean, and again, Africa is not certainly the only region in the world that has suffered from these imperially imposed borders. Obviously, as you know, someone whose training is in Middle East, that is in many ways the story of the modern Middle East is, is a lot of these states with, with lines that were literally drawn on a map by a French and a British diplomat and then parceled out amongst the great powers you know, trying, trying to, to, to manage this and, and, and doing so with, with great difficulty uh, for its people. But again, I, I think what I appreciated about that speech was just saying, listen, let's, let's focus on making this work. Let's develop, let's, you know, we, these were imposed on us. It's true. But if we are trying to, to redraw those lines that will lead to more pain, let's, let's, you know, try to build governments that actually serve our people in this context. It seems like this is in some ways related to the, factions that have emerged on the left with approach to this issue. Mm -hmm. So there is one faction that I don't want to mischaracterize anybody. I mean, there's, there's, there's kind of like ridiculous versions of, of each faction, I would say, but there is a group that's being accused of not sufficiently recognizing that what Russia is doing is imperialism too, because they are overly invested or, so blinded by their distaste for American imperialism that they might go too far in saying that Russia is doing absolutely nothing wrong because they don't want that to become a pretext for America becoming overly involved. Yeah. And whether or not you credit aspects of that argument, I think has something to do with these questions around self-determination mm -hmm. and how we should respond to a group of people articulation of wanting to identify nationally differently, putting aside the question of what, how, how widespread that desire is and whether or not it's, you know, propagandized or motivated by other things and stuff like that. And right. I wonder, you know, if you've thought at all about that bigger picture question, mm -hmm. because it does seem to be at the root of so many of the conf the foreign policy conflicts that end up coming up on this show. Yeah, no, I, and let me just say, I'm, you know, I'm aware of, you know, the, the kind of tendencies you're talking about. Certainly I, 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 I read them, I, I listen to them, agree or disagree. And I'll just say, like, I think, you know, 
you know, reflexive opposition to imperialism and suspicion of the American military industrial complex and the foreign policy establishment is a good starting point. Um, as as a general rule, given especially what we've seen um, over the past 20 years, obviously even farther back, but especially over the past 20 years, as we've seen, you know, human rights and liberating peoples and, and all the other stuff used um, as a way to draw in liberals and, and, and even progressives to support these disastrously destructive military interventions and, and adventures and misadventures around the world. Um, but I think, you know, the, the way I would approach it, and I think the way Senator Sanders has approached it is focusing on this question of solidarity. What does it mean to kind of be in solidarity with the Ukrainian people in this case? What does it mean to be in solidarity with even perhaps people in eastern Ukraine, some of them who do want to be closer to Russia? I mean, again, I don't haven't seen evidence myself that this is a there is a large consensus in favor of that. Certainly, there's no large consensus in these regions to be caught in the middle of a new war uh, that Russia is launching. But I think, you know, looking at the anti-imperialist question, yeah, let's recognize the United States is guilty of a lot, but that should not prevent us from seeing what Russia is doing right now, which is imperialism, certainly in its own way. I think, again, referring to that speech that Putin gave yesterday is overtly imperialism. I mean, he is he has made clear that he is not just trying to reconstruct the Soviet Union. He actually called the creation of Ukraine a product of Leninism and communism, and he was trying to reverse that. So he is actually reaching back into a much, much, much earlier conception of kind of Russian imperial nationalism. Um, so I think it's, you know, for those of us who want to, you know, oppose this sort of violence, wherever it arises, it's important to acknowledge. Well, this is this is the other part of the question. And we had uh, Stephen Simler on and um, Shahid Buttar talking about this after mm-hmm. the Afghanistan w- withdrawal, mm-hmm. which is if you reject isolationism as too broad, even as an anti-imperialist, if you recognize that you wouldn't want to be the person who sat World War II out and that there is a such thing as a kind of um, uh, the types of genocide uh, that would demand ethically a response, Mm -hmm. then how do you start to you know, create a metric for what that looks like, because right. fundamentally that also seems to be the problem where we're in this conversation about whether or not Putin is doing imperialism or whether America is justified to comment on Putin's imperialism because of its own imperialism only because we're in this conversation about should America act and to what extent does it have the right to act? Does it have the right to behave as though it's the police of the world, even if Putin is doing an imperialism? Is that really the point? The question is, what is our role here? Right. No, again, uh, and you're right. So, you know, how I approach is, okay, what are the set of questions? Or actually, you know, I have a set of questions that I would tend to go through is, you know, the most basic question in terms of, you know, the United States using military violence is, you know, is this necessary to protect the American people? Are we under attack? Um, that's a key responsibility of any government. I think anyone across the political spectrum would, would agree with that. But, you know, as a progressive, I do, you know, my my definition of being progressive is that you know i have we have responsibilities to each other and to the extent that we have the power to stop suffering and violence in other places we should think about what tools and policies we can pursue to help do that now that you can very quickly get into just straight up interventionism and again as we saw over the past 20 years these were excuses that were used to draw us into some really disastrous policies but the questions i would ask here is you know, are are people under imminent threat of mass atrocity? Is there mass violence being threatened against people? Um, what are we acting in, you know, in the, are we acting, you know, with the kind of imprimatur of international law? Um, are we acting multilaterally? Are we mobilizing um, an international consensus? Or are we acting unilaterally? Um, what are the actual possible outcomes that we are trying to recreate? And what's the realistic, what's the likelihood and risks and costs um, of pursuing pursuing possible military and, and action that, there. That that's all of those are so incredibly yeah. subjective. Quite and right. That's where we. That's why people are so skeptical. I, I've seen yeah. people tweeting and talking about. Well, since when do we care about um, you know infringement of national borders? Well, since when do we care about genocide? When you look to the Israel Palestine conflict, since when you know and you see this this inconsistency applied all over the place. The Rwandan genocide. I mean, there are all of these instances where we very much chose not to get involved. And it, it's difficult not to And choose to see not to get involved as, even today, right now. That's right. Well, I mean, well, let's talk about the extent to which we are 
getting involved today. Joe Biden has said we're going to do these targeted sanctions mm-hmm. of uh, Yeah, I mean, oligarchs. not get involved in other situations, but yeah, let's let's talk about oh, what I we are doing here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so what what is lay out lay out what um Biden has said that America's going to do so far? Well, he's made clear from very early on that we're not talking about US forces entering Ukraine um or being engaged here. At the same time, he has made clear the US is going to honor our military, you know, commitments that we have you know, the NATO treaty, the NATO alliance is a military alliance. We are treaty bound to defend countries that are part of that organization. So, you know, we have troops in a number of these places already. He's deployed several thousand more troops. He's moved troops to different places uh, uh, in countries bordering Ukraine just to, you know, reassure those allies. Um, but he's also yesterday he announced a whole set of sanctions on on some of Putin's you know government members of his government who oligarchs who are closely associated with Putin, sanctions on Russian banks, um, and sanctions on you know preventing U.S. investment or kind of trade with any of the kind of newly recognized uh, uh, two uh, provinces um, in eastern Ukraine. So, and I, I meant to ask this earlier. So when we we're talking about invasion. Mm-hmm. Russia's invasion. What we're talking about is that recognition of those two provinces as independent, as sovereign. Right. right. I mean, that was how Putin created a legal pretext to further invade. Yes. It's it's not that we're talking about, you know, boots on the ground, marching in, storming the Bastille as of yet. It's, it's that recognition that is being characterized as the invasion and the more physical kind of invasion. That's what we were talking about in 2014. Well, twenty. Well, again, we are talking about Russian troops entering these regions now, and recognition of them as independent is what, from Russia's perspective, provides Russia the legal pretext to do that. In 2014, as as I said earlier, you saw a much more. There was, you know, there was a, a sense of Russia wanted a sense of deniability, so there were, you know, military contractors and and others who were acting, um, not overtly Russian uniformed troops at that time. So this is more overt. I've seen leftists argue that because NATO was formed as a anti-Soviet defense treaty and the Soviet Union does not exist, that we shouldn't be talking in terms of moving NATO troops around Mm -hmm. or kind of blithely dismissing Putin's frustrations about the growth of NATO, expansion of NATO, as pretextual, regardless of whether or not they are, that we should remove that pretext, that we should give firm assurances that Ukraine will not mm-hmm. be joining NATO and perhaps be talking about ending NATO altogether, dissolving NATO altogether. What do you what do you think yeah. about those kinds of arguments? I mean, I would say first with regard to I mean, I totally agree that we should not blithely disregard um, Putin's, you know, what he says about NATO, because even U.S. officials going back 30 years since the fall of the Soviet Union, including um, and, you know, uh, Senator Sanders mentioned this in the recent floor speech that he gave on this. One of those people is current CIA director Bill Burns, who in his uh, really good book of uh, the back channel talks about being a, a diplomat in Moscow at the time and reporting back um, through the years that this is a broadly held concern. It's not just something Putin invented. This goes back 30 years. Russians, Russian officials are very, very concerned. Understandably, as you said, this was a military alliance that was created to confront the Soviet Union. Others like former you know, Clinton Secretary of Defense Bill Perry have said the exact same thing. So this is uh, politically a real concern. The question is, OK, it is one of many concerns and grievances that Putin himself laid out. But that certainly doesn't mean that we dismiss it. I think we have to take it seriously. And just I, I think the Biden administration does take it seriously. Um, if you, you know, you look at, you know, the kind of consultations that were taking place between the U.S. and allies. And then you look at, say, uh, you know, French President Macron going over to sit with Putin for a number of hours and coming out and saying, you know, basically, we're, you know, we're ready to talk about NATO. You saw uh, new German Chancellor Olaf Scholz doing the same thing, coming out, saying something very, very similar. I think when you, you know, you know, look at the kind of signaling that was going on here, it was signaled very, very clearly that these we're ready to talk about this. Because, you know, again, the Biden administration, in my view, did not want to be dealing with this right now. You know, they've got a lot else on their plate and dealing with a potential new invasion of Europe 
um, is, 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 is going to suck all the oxygen out of everything else. From what I've, you know, seen publicly and just, you know, from conversations I've also had, I, I think they've made clear they're ready to talk uh, about NATO. Um, but well, I what does talk it, about, what does talking about NATO mean? I think it, you know, uh, make a real good faith effort to address these concerns. They are not dismiss, dismissing them. Um, I address think some, them by saying Ukraine is never going to join NATO, that right. nobody's ever going to join NATO again, or actually going so far as to say NATO is not necessary anymore. No, I don't think they would say NATO is not necessary anymore. And again, that's a conversation we should also have. But I, I think I don't think the, 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 the this administration would, would go that far. And I don't think our allies want us to go that far. Um, but in terms of Ukraine joining NATO, I think they were in a bit of, bit of a difficulty because, you know, you don't want to just to say to Ukraine, sorry, you can't join, but they do understand and everyone understands. And frankly, Vladimir Putin understands that Ukraine is not going to be joining NATO. It's it's one of those weird kind of, you know, diplomatic um, kind of double speaks where, yes, I mean, and let's, you know, just to back up here, the only reason that we talk about Ukraine possibly joining NATO was because George W. Bush kind of just made this statement at the end of his presidency in 2008, talked about, yeah, we're going to have Ukraine and Georgia join NATO. And everyone in his own government was like, wait, well, what did you just say? Uh. And so now we're kind of, we've been stuck in this kind of weird limbo where, where people are uncomfortable about walking that back. Um, but it's also not something that's going to happen. Yeah, the, the politics of this are interesting. So, you know, you said you said that, you know, Biden doesn't want this. He has a lot on his plate right now. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it is a midterm year. Things aren't looking good for Democrats, et cetera, et cetera. But when I watched uh, his speech uh, from Tuesday, I believe, the short speech, I did observe that there did seem to be an emphasis on, look, I know that we got to stop Russia kind of accepting that there's a certain appetite in America for confronting our enemies, as it were, mm. but that Americans are going to have to pay for it by paying more at the, at the gas tank. This is, the, this is the price of us being, you know, the, the global defenders. As I said last week, defending freedom will have cost for us as well. And here at home, we need to be honest about that. But as we will do, but as we do this, I'm going to take robust action to make sure the pain of our sanctions is targeted at a Russian economy, not ours. And it seemed like even if it's not a desire, like no one's asking mm -hmm. for this, there is a way that Democrats might choose to capitalize on rising gas prices as a consequence of this altercation, as opposed to what's happening now where Joe Biden, rightly or wrongly, is being blamed for high gas prices, even though much of it can be attributed to supply chain issues, yeah. et cetera. I don't, I don't know that I entirely, I would entirely agree that nobody wants this because there, there is a way that going to war has historically helped candidates. Right. No, I, I recognize that. And again, I mean, there is, you know, one of the things I'm always concerned about is there is a tendency in, in, in Washington, a kind of reflexive instinct, the idea that we can build national unity around conflicts. That's not unique to the United States. That's unique throughout history. And that is extremely dangerous. Um, but it is very politically attractive. Um, at the same time, I don't think anyone in the administration, and I don't, you know, <laughs> believes that there's a way that higher gas prices work out well for them. Mm. You know, I mean, because as you said, there are lots of reasons why inflation is happening. Um, partly, you know, supply chain, partly just corporate greed. Um, and whatever the reasons are, the American people ultimately are going to punish the, you know, the ruling party for that. And I think that's true for this as well. While we're talking about how this might be politicized, I also saw some folks talking about how the fact, the fact that NATO is being, is in the discourse in the way that it hasn't been in a really long time. Mm -hmm. And that made me reflect on how Donald Trump often would talk about how, you know, NATO, our, our allies in Europe aren't pulling their weight. We're paying all these tax dollars and we're funding all of these troops and we're the ones that have to do all this stuff. 23 of the 28 member nations are still not paying what they should be paying and what they are supposed to be paying for their defense. This is not fair to the people and taxpayers of the United States. And many of these nations owe massive amounts of money from past years and not paying 
in those past years. And it was a really interesting anti-interventionist kind of posture Mm -hmm. from a Republican president. And I wonder if you are thinking at all about how the right might be capitalizing this moment in that same way. I know that Tucker Carlson and some other right wing uh, conservative commentators have been making this similar kind of case already. There are a lot of factors here driving us toward war over Ukraine, but one of them, a, a central one, is NATO. So what is NATO and what is the purpose of NATO since the fall of the Soviet Union 30 years ago that NATO was designed as a bulwark exam- against? Well, no one can answer that question, not one person. And yet the same people who cooked up the Iraq war are now insisting that Ukraine must join NATO anyway. That would mean putting American military hardware right on Russia's border. And Russia doesn't want that any more than we would want Russian missiles in Tijuana. Hence the tension. Now the irony, as Clint Ehrlich pointed out, is that NATO doesn't even want Ukraine to join. In other words, the whole thing is nuts. It serves no American interest whatsoever. It is yet another manufactured crisis, this one devised by restless power-hungry neocons in Washington looking for another war. Right. No, I mean, I think that it fits with, you know, Trump's general we're getting ripped off approach. Mm -hmm. I mean, the system is rigged. You know, they're ripping you off. They're taking from us. I'm here to help you. But I mean, at the same time, that the criticism of NATO, even though Trump did it in his own, you know, very Trump way, was not did not begin with Trump. I mean, Obama himself regularly, you know, pushed the Europeans on meeting their own commitments uh, to NATO uh, and going pretty far in some cases, or at least that's how the Europeans uh, perceived it. Um, because again, even though you know Trump made these made these you know statements and claims in his own really divisive way, he was tapping into something that is that is genuine, I think, among a lot of Americans, which is like, how are these, how is this expansive global military presence? How are all these agreements and alliances and these conferences where people go and hang around hotels and drink coffee? How does this all help us? I mean, how does this, how does this help my family and my community? How does it help me get a better job? How does it help my kid get into a good school and build a good life? And that, you know, you know, defending the con, you know, helping to understand how the questions Americans have and think through, you know, okay, how does this actually help all those things? And I think that in some cases there are good answers. I think, you know, collective security is an important thing. Um, and that should be part of the conversation about NATO. But I think too often those of us who work in Washington don't actually think about it in those terms enough in a way that we can, we can discuss it with um, our fellow Americans. It's been explained to me by people who know better that a lot of this seems to be about this weird kind of um, psychodrama that's been going on with Russia and the West and an inferiority complex Mm. that has emerged because of a lack of disrespect perceived Mm. or real that the West has had toward Russia following over to when Mm -hmm. it's when Russia suffered so many casualties, 20 million plus casualties in, in helping to win that war. And then has been treated kind of like as the ugly stepchild, Cole Ward, uh, McCarthy, and all of the things that have happened since then, Red Scared and all that stuff. And NATO, it feels like is playing a role in the cycle drama. We're the cool kids team <laughs> and you're Russia. Yeah. I mean, right. for listeners who have been enthralled by the Anna Delvey story, as I have been the last couple of days of binge watching, you know, there is this scene where she, you know, Russian immigrant to Germany is bullied by all of the cool girls at her boarding school in Germany. And it, I I had this image of, mm-hmm. you know, P- Putin in this kind of like not very chic outfit getting bullied in the same way. <laughs> yeah. And like to what extent, to what extent is Wood, Wood saying, hey, maybe we're not going to, I don't know, how much is this, is, of this is like this kind of interpersonal drama that can be resolved by like a meeting of the minds. Yeah. Um, and, and not, you know, sh- some offering of respect or yeah. solidarity. Yeah. No, I think, you know, it, it's, you know, you don't want to overestimate, but nor should we estimate the role that national pride and humiliation plays in international politics, you know, at the very macro and at the micro level, even within states. I mean, this is, there's an element of this, even within the Ukraine, Russia, uh, conflict, right? Because you, 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 Ukrainians, you know, they, they rightfully are offended by the kind of argument that, like, oh, you're just, you're our, you're our little Russian brothers. You know, there's, there's a very much an element of that going on there too. Um, 
you know, and Putin himself has referred to the collapse of the Soviet Union as the biggest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. So clearly the loss of status um, that occurred there and, and certainly the way that the United States and the Western countries responded there by just rushing in and, you know, imposing neoliberalism, which in turn, you know, empowered a whole set of really corrupt oligarchs, which, you know, Putin in turn brought under his control uh, and helps him rule. I mean, the United States helped create that situation and it's not the first and only place where the United States uh, ran this scam. Uh, so we, we we need to be very, very cognizant of that. And so I think we need to take these questions of, of national pride seriously. At the same time, I think we also need to recognize when leaders simply exploit that on the part of their people. And certainly that's something we see in our country all the time. And it's not just Donald Trump. I mean, national pride is deployed all the time here in the United States. It often goes under the undercover of the term American exceptionalism, whatever term we want to call it. Um, but it's a it's a pretty powerful force in politics. Well, you mentioned the sanctions again, and I wanted to follow up on that because I've seen I've heard one commentator offer that it might this might ultimately help Putin, who's been trying to repatriate some of those oligarch funds mm, for some right. time. But also the, the my bigger question, though, is how possible is it to do these kinds of targeted sanctions? Because many on the left are, you know, critical of sanctions mm -hmm. that are overly broad and end up help, yeah. hurting the people of the country who right. are not responsible for the political right. whims of its leadership. Right. And that's absolutely the right place, the right question to ask, because I think we've, you know, we just look no farther than Afghanistan to the absurd way that we use these sanctions to immiserate populations. Um, you know, the logic being that they will then put pressure on their leaders who don't care about them anyway. It makes zero sense. But we've, you know, created this in the wake of 9-11, we've created this enormous industry um, of, of, of new sanctions tools. Um, and, and, you know, in this whole this whole cadre of sanctions experts whose only job is coming up with new ways to prevent people from accessing money. Um, you know, in some cases, there's there's good good logic behind it. Um, so, yeah, I think focusing on, you know, specific regime actors, people implicated in these decisions, people implicated in human rights abuses. Um, I think there's great value there. And I do think that has shown to really make an impact. But we have to be really careful not to not to simply impose sanctions that won't hurt these people, because that's, you know, these regimes take care of themselves and end up just, you know, you know, creating more suffering on the part of these populations. But thus far, it seems that that, that the Biden administration has not has not not gone there yet. Um, and I very much hope and, you know, Senator Sanders has has cautioned against this as well. But is there real risk? I mean, because there is this threat that's that says this is where we're starting. But if you don't slow your roll, it's going to get worse. And I think that's where a lot of leftists are. They just see the slippery slope. Yep. And the fact that what, it, you know, are the, the American pushback is measured at this time doesn't give many folks a lot of comfort. No, and I and I think that that's right. I mean, I, I am agreeing with those concerns, but I think the question that that we'll have is like, okay, what tools do we actually have to put pressure in response to this, um, while at the same time constantly making clear that there's a diplomatic off ramp, which is something again I think the Biden administration has been doing here. Yeah, I'm agreeing with that caution. I'm agreeing with those criticisms and concerns about this massive kind of thicket of sanctions the United States tends to create in these situations, and, and we need to avoid it. What What do you think Putin's end goal here is? Because it's difficult to me. This isn't a situation where it's a resource resource rich mm -hmm. region that mm -hmm. it's a clear like land grab. The argument that he set out is this kind of revisionist history about brotherhood and kinship and reuniting and all of this stuff. It, it's so ephemeral. It's so like psychological. You know, it's 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 not material. It doesn't seem. And so it's difficult to understand in this world where we have two nuclear powers yeah. and mutually assured destruction, and Putin doesn't seem to be a, a Trumpian kind of uh, imbe <laughs> imbecile, you know, <laughs> being being driven purely by it, although that's yeah. always a factor. Why do you think now we're mm. having this kind of escalation? Yeah, yeah I, I think... You know, I don't want to oversimplify it, but it does seem just looking at the evidence, looking at what Putin has told us about what he wants, looking at the steps that he has taken, um, he does want to, you know, reestablish Russia as a great power that the rest of the world has to take seriously. What does um, that mean? 
Right. I mean, like Again. Russia, you're big, you're great. Like who's who who right. who is really um dis- yeah. disputing this at this you point? Know, you're the biggest country yeah, in the world. Kudos. Yeah, America's got a whole lot of challenges. Uh, Russia is a regional power that is threatening some of its immediate neighbors. A regional power. Regional power. Yeah, if we, you know, if we could just gather, like, you know, the the Security Council, everyone get together, give him a big hug, and tell him he matters, and and people like him. <laughs> we should try I it. See I, you. I, I, I hear think you. I, I see you. <laughs> I, you know, I know it's not your fault. Well, it is kind of. Right. Um, but. No, I, I think again, like I said, you don't want to underestimate national the you know power of, of national pride and 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 humiliation. So I think yes, establishing Russia as or kind of reinventing um, you know what he conceives of Russia as a great power, and that certainly uh, seems to include Ukraine. Um, and then the question is, okay, what are the you know what what is a diplomatic resolution um, that that averts that? Because again, I, I just you know don't think we 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 should, and I know that this administration is not going to accept, and our allies, and I think the international community will not accept him simply taking over um, a, a smaller, less powerful neighbor. Nor should they. Um, but just getting back to one thing you said earlier, yes, our ability to actually kind of mobilize this consensus and act, I think, with some legitimacy, would be made much much stronger if we would act with some consistency ourselves with regard to our own repressive authoritarian allies and partners. There's no question about that. I mean, when people, you know, when I hear people talking about, you know, the 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 international rules-based order, you know, I think about Gandhi's response when someone asked him what he thought about Western civilization, he said, I think it would be a good idea. You know, <laughs> that is what I think here. It's like, yeah, let's let's actually try that. But that requires, you know, the United States take making some real effort to to follow it ourselves and 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 to kind of stop support for other you know client and partner states that are that are violating it on a daily basis so you think that the end goal is all of the all of ukraine because it's one thing to say because the argument that's being made is an argument for these particular regions that have russian speakers in them mm-hmm. and a certain percentage of the population mm-hmm. that does have affinity for russia that's a different argument than saying we are entitled to the entirety of this country. Hmm. I think that's right. Um, but still, there is it is it is clearly a false pretext. You know, it's not there was no meaningful outcry uh, for independence from these regions. Um, and, and it's, you know, one can also can criticize the Ukrainian government. Certainly, they're a, they've been a struggling democracy. They have their own corruption and oligarchy problem. Um, in part because the same methods of of, of liberalization, so called, were imposed in Ukraine that were opposed in Russia, but you know, I I think we can, you know, support Ukraine's efforts to manage democratically and pluralistically these challenges within a context of a of unified Ukraine without justifying or, or granting any justification to what Putin's doing. Right, but is there a pretext that's being put out that would lead to? Russia trying to take possession of the entire country? Or is the pretexts yeah. that are being established right now just more right. limited in scope? Well, I think, I mean, it seems to me if you take Putin at his word and that his, what really concerns him is an independent Ukraine, it seems, it's hard for me to see how he stops here, right? Because what he's got here is a smaller and much more nationalistic and pro-Western Ukraine than he had before. And that doesn't solve the problem as as he he claims to see it. And so then, what's the end game? Again, I'm back to this point. If if he, yeah. you know, if we presume that it's not going to stop here, yeah. What does the U.S. do? Because okay, so we've said the targeted sanctions. We've said we're stopping um, this oil line between Germany and Russia. And there's this discussion about what it means to have non lethal military aid, mm-hmm. non lethal aid which has led to a broader discussion about the ethics of providing any kind of uh, arms or something that stops short of arms to a country, given our historical record of those goods being getting into the wrong hands, especially given that there's been a conversation about various groups on both sides of this in Ukraine that have ties to neo-Nazi groups, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I think there, you know, there is, there is evidence of a neo-Nazi presence presence in 
you know, in Ukraine, certainly they have far right wing nationalists there as they do in a lot of places. I, I would not overstate that, but but it does exist. Um, I think the question of arms. Yeah, that's a tough one because it's not like who's do they fall into the wrong hands, but it's also do we get into a situation where we're ultimately feeding and lengthening in a war without the ability to ultimately change its outcome? That's a difficult question. Um, so in terms of what we do, I would say, I mean, the sanctions, focusing those sanctions on on Putin and the people around him. And by the way, that will include acting much more aggressively on European and American banks. Again, something the Senator, Senator Sanders said in his statement yesterday, moving much more aggressively against American and European banks that are hiding these people's money. And that involves going after very powerful people in Europe and the United States. And if, and if you are serious about making this hurt, you're going to have to confront those interests. You know, that involves, I mean, a lot of these people's money is in not only banks, but it's in real estate in London, in New York. It's hidden in shell companies and trusts that are, you know, run out of South Dakota, Nevada. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot we can do. But we have to be serious about taking on this political fight. Well, well are we serious? Because I was listening to a guest on um, a Katie Halper stream l- yeah. last night who said that one of the oligarchs in question owns one of the major soccer teams, Chelsea Arsenal, yeah. one of these teams, right. and they're not being touched basically because it would be inconvenient for all right. of the soccer fans in the UK. No, I, that's right. That's right. I mean, no, I mean, it's good. I mean, they. I, I think the, the Biden administration has said some really great things about anti-corruption. I think they rolled out a, a pretty impressive anti-corruption agenda just a couple months ago. Um, I think, unfortunately, it lacked a kind of domestic component because ultimately, if we're serious about anti-corruption, we need to start at home. And by the way, that includes campaign finance reform, um, because that's the corruption that we just all agree not to call corruption, and we should not agree not to do that. Um, Other things, too, again, I mean, if we really want to deny... um, you know, these kind of authoritarian petro states, the revenues they require, we also need to be talking about a, a serious investment in, in a global green energy transition. That's all got to be a part of this. Now, this this corruption point is is a difficult one. I just had Ash Kara, assembly member from California who was shepherding through the CalCare uh, bill in the show. And I asked him, well, are you, do you think that Gavin Newsom is corrupt? And he stopped short of mm-hmm. saying that he was. And, you know, there was this moment during the 2020 campaign where, you know, Zephyr Teachout wrote an article about Mm -hmm. Joe Biden being corrupt. And there was some hesitancy from the campaign to stand by that statement. And it does feel a little, a little nambly pambly to say, we need to be serious about corruption at home when it seems like people within the Democratic Party are unwilling to call out their own party members as corrupt. Even when we see Nancy Pelosi grandstanding about not wanting to stop Congress members from being able to insider trade something that should be so base level yep. and obvious as yeah, a prohibition. I right. I don't disagree. And this is why I, I feel like the reaction to that and the and the legislation led by Senator Ossoff banning that um, is great. We need to be serious about that. I mean, I think there's a this is a tough conversation that we need to have. But if we're serious about corruption, we need to have it. All right. Well, I mean, I, I want to go back a little bit to this neo-Nazi point because a, a lot of people are frustrated that that is being overemphasized in all of this. Mm -hmm. And some people who are, you know, it's interesting to me because to me, it's almost a moot point whether or not there's neo-Nazis. I mean, the, the, the issue of providing arms is so Mm -hmm. distasteful. The idea of it is so distasteful to me for a multitude of reasons. The idea that there's like good guys with guns, it's not where I'm at, but can you talk a little bit about how this issue is being, discussed in the media and how we should think about, you know, why, why is it, why is it an issue that you think that people are overstating um, the relevance of these neo-Nazi groups? I mean, I, I see, you know, for some who are, you know, inclined to, you know, not, I'm not going to claim that anyone is taking Russia's side. I don't think that's productive here. It's certainly within kind of the intra-left conversation. Um, I'm happy to say it about Tucker Carlson, but I think, you know, just in terms of making an argument, well, there are no clean hands here. You know, there's bad guys everywhere. You know, yes. I mean, there, as I said, there are neo-Nazi and far-right parties uh, in, in Ukraine. This is unfortunately a part of Ukraine's politics um, and has been for a long time. Um, I don't, no one should deny that. But again, I think I, I often see, see it being used to make, you know, if you want to make an argument that we shouldn't supply arms, I think you have quite enough reasons of why insurgencies are violent and destructive and horrible. 
without the extra added point of, oh, by the way, some of these are, are neo-Nazis. I think that the sort of situation that we might be talking about of a, an insurgency fighting a Russian occupation of Ukraine is quite ugly enough without getting into that. What happens if we took the kind of uh, reductio ad absurdum version of the most kind of left argument, the, the, the most, I shouldn't say the most left argument, but the most anti-imperialist argument, mm-hmm. which says this is none of our business. You are selectively picking and choosing which in, which conflicts to engage in based on a perceived American interest or wanting to politicize something mm-hmm. or having your military, senior military officials coming through the Raytheon revolving door. And we shouldn't believe anybody's motives in the U.S. for getting involved. This is no better or worse than anything that else is, that, is, that has happened recently. And we should do absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. This is just fully not our concern. What do you make of that argument and where does that lead us to? Like, what what do you see the outcome of something like that being? I see it, you know, in Ukraine, I, I see it as leading to more suffering rather than less. Um, and ultimately, that's kind of a question I need to ask. What am I doing? The policies I support, the ideas I have, um, is this leading to, to more suffering um, or less? And I think we do have the ability to, to kind of to, to create less suffering. Well, um, let's let's yeah, get us out a, a little bit because... Mm-hmm. The more suffering, I presume, is Russia takes over Ukraine. There's infighting for who knows how long as a consequence. Maybe other European powers that are in us end up in direct conflict with Russia. I mean, this is mm-hmm. an example where right. we truly just decide not to get involved. Yeah. And, okay, that's that. What version where we do get involved and Putin does choose to keep escalating? I guess the argument is if we're involved, Putin may think twice about escalating. Well, what do you Maybe. mean by involved? Like. Troops, U.S. troops involved or? Well, that's that is my question. Right. I mean, th- we are kind of talking, presuming as though what Biden has said he's going to do already is going to stop this in its tracks, which it might have oh, right. been yes. a kind of weird detente since 2014. And no one seemed to really be especially bothered. Like we haven't yeah. had World War Three headlines for the past yeah. six years. Right. But what is happening now does feel different. And it's not clear to me how much of that is a media creation. And how much of that is circumstantial means is because of their, their circumstantial differences. Yeah, no, I think it is different. Again, for the reasons I said, I think just the number of, of troops you have involved in this operation is very, very different from what we saw in 2014. So the things that Putin think himself that, is, I mean, just so, the claims he is making and the pretext he is offering are very different. So between the, the hour long speech about Russian national pride and mm-hmm. the 100, what is it, 170,000 yeah, troops? Around 170,000, yeah. Are you saying that there is a a real you that is perceived to be a real credible threat that there is a full blown invasion afoot like that's that's imminent? I think it is a credible threat. I mean, I know that you know the administration has been saying it's imminent for a while, um, but just you know, why do you mass one hundred and seventy thousand troops on three sides of a neighboring? Well, that's country? the thing. If that's true, then. A little sanction here, a little sanction there, yes. some non-lethal aid and cutting off yeah. access to a gas pipeline isn't doing anything. Oh, no, I, I don't disagree. I mean, listen, they recognize and we all should recognize. I mean, just for a whole bunch of reasons, Putin has, you know, what's called escalation dominance here. I mean, there is even if the United States were to decide we are going to send U.S. troops to into Ukraine, it would take weeks, perhaps months to actually get the number of troops, you know, to actually do that. And NATO um, and, troops, they don't have enough. You're, there's no not enough troop resources. It, it, in it would take it would take you know sh- you know. Let's just say Putin could conceivably take all of Ukraine much quicker than it would take the United States to actually get troops in place um, to to respond or to. So is Trump meet them is Trump up. right? NATO's not pulling its fair weight. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I think you know the point is he's not threatening nato countries right i mean he under, i think this is part of you know why biden is actually strengthening the u.s presence in these countries is precisely because they have an alliance and putin understands that um but again should you know should putin decide to move you know to push west in, in into ukraine it seems pretty clear he is he's able to do that so again being realistic about our ability to stop this and the tools we actually have to to kind of change his mind or change his behavior you know, we do have to be realistic about that. And that is something Washington is very, very bad at. I mean, there is a kind of belief in the magical power of, of you know, magical abilities of American power. But talking through, OK, what can we actually do to change this situation is a tougher one. 
But also, what is our authority? Because I, I feel yeah. like so much of this left argument is about yeah. you're here an imperialist. Because there, there's a fundamental question here. The, the, the people who are like, don't do anything, anything, any American behavior is anti-imperialist. They're got, kind of getting laughed off the stage as absurd. But I think they're raising a really important question about what is our authority? Okay, NATO mm-hmm. is NATO. Russia is Russia. Mm-hmm. There's a no man's land of people in between. And the problem is that we have these two superpowers basically deciding how to parcel up and exert control over the rest of the world that basically doesn't have nukes. And sorry, go ahead. Do you want to? No, I would just say, I mean, well, you also have the Ukrainians who are saying what they want and don't want. And I think that matters yeah, too. But these things are a mixed bag. And if you if you look at even America, okay, what does America want? Does America want Trump, because Trump was president for four years. Now, does America want Biden? Are we all supposed to be enthusiastic Biden bros because Biden's president? Are Biden's foreign policy whims ours? Are Trump's? Are Obama's? Are I don't. I don't. It's so. It, yeah. Countries not, are diverse. People. I are think diverse. they are diverse. They are diverse. But I'm also not gonna. I don't think we should one hand, other hand this. Okay. Ukraine clearly does not want to be dominated by Russia. They don't want to be dominated by the West right. either. So let's say 100% Ukraine does not want to be, let's just concede that entirely. Mm -hmm. That still raises the question, on what authority does America, from a zillion miles away, play peacekeeper here? And it's not that, you know, I'm not even necessarily asserting that we shouldn't ever, because again, there's this World War II example that's always floating over our heads. We all Mm -hmm. kind of agree there's this platonic ideal (laughs) of a crisis that we should intervene in. I mean, not not everyone would even agree with that, but right, right. It's troublesome, and you're always going to get leftists who are upset as long as you don't have something more concrete as a rationale for why us. So right. we're having this conversation about what Ukrainian people want. When, on some level, to that conversation, it's it's moot. I, I mean, I, that's, I don't mean to sound dismissive or like yeah. there shouldn't be diplomatic interventions and those kinds of things. Yeah. But what is America's authority to come in here and say, oh, we're going to defend you from this bully other than we want to protect our own sphere of influence in a way that is ultimately, yes, imperialism? No? No, I I think we can we can and should have that conversation um, while at the same time recognizing, listen, we have treaty allies in this region who are very concerned about what is happening. We have Ukraine that is very concerned about what is happening and wants the United States to help them resist this. I, I think we could, you know, the one conversation, I don't think it, both important, but shouldn't happen to the exclusion of the other, if that makes sense. I, I'm with you, but it does feel like the the conversation about what is America's authority isn't happening at all because everyone who raises it is being kind of dismissed as unserious. Well, I think, no, I don't, I don't think it's unserious at all. I think it is a very good question. I mean, I would also mention here, like, you know, one would hope that the United Nations would act for the purpose that it was initially conceived. But unfortunately, you have one of the countries involved here, um, Russia, with a veto over the Security Council. So it does create a real problem uh, for generating that kind of, you know, legitimacy, or at least the kind of UN imprimatur that, you know, I think a lot of liberals and progressives would, would hope we could get in a situation like this. So in the absence of that, the question is, how are you generating international legitimacy? Um, And I think just what I said before about, you know, what countries in the region are actually asking for the United States to do, what Ukraine itself um, is asking the United States to do in this case, I think does generate some measure of legitimacy. That doesn't answer the whole question. Yeah, I mean, I mean, part of this legitimate legitimacy issue is that there are people who argue that to the extent that there is a desire by the, the democratically elected Ukrainian government to resist Russia and to have America's help, you know, the leadership is being called an American puppet regime. And, you know, the the West calls the separatists uh, Russian puppets. And there is a lack of confidence and self-determination that seems to be really at the core of a lot of this. No one can tell yeah. who is genuinely self-determined. I mean, I think, you know... I don't think anyone disagrees that the Ukrainian government was democratically elected for all its faults. Um, As I said, it has its own corruption and oligarchy problem, for sure. Um, But still, I don't think that leaves, you know, the legitimacy a completely open question here. So 
I, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go. And I know that we're in this really <laughs> thorny, weird, like kind of. Yeah. Um, no, this is good. And I just want to say, like, this is why I was excited to join join you for the conversation because I mean, I've just been so impressed with these kind of really smart and tough conversations that you have. Um, so I'll just say well, that. Oh, I appreciate it. I'm very glad to be joined by someone who doesn't have to read a million Wikipedia entries about uh, <laughs> the Balkans. You know, <laughs> like, oh, oh, you, you, you haven't noticed me scrolling over here. I, I, I search very, very uh, subtly. No. But look, I, 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 I tried to be upfront about my relative ignorance mm -hmm. because there it's, I think it's dangerous for these conversations to be kind of happening above everybody's head and it, they are accessible to everyone. But like my brother is, was like an international relations guy and is very good at all of this. And I caught up on the phone. I'm like, Brandon, talk to me about things. And he's like, well, in, you know, there's this 17, da, 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 there was this uh, new treaty that said that we'd... I'm like, okay, Brandon, like, yeah, relax. This is a little bit yeah. too much, but that's sometimes the level of a conversation that we get into, yeah. you know, when we're starting mm -hmm. these foreign policy conversations. So I really appreciate your patience here. Absolutely. I guess I, I don't mean to sound overly credulous of the Kremlin. Like I understand that's like the worst sin that you can commit, <laughs> but I, I, I do want to, credit that especially in the case of any am uh, ambiguity and there being these fundamental issues of borders and a lack of kind of fundamental self-determination that's the consequence of colonialism and imperialism and our dis our decision to divide up the world in these ways as as like a mm -hmm. global community mm -hmm. that sometimes i feel like the most important part of all of this is getting sidestepped and you would get a lot more buy-in to the extent that you wanted buy-in from the broader left community, if there were a fun, fundamental conversation being had about when and where America is justified yes, or any country is yes. justified in intervening. And it can yes. feel like a really callous conversation. Like let's leave, let's leave Ukrainians like, oh, well, they got yeah. a deal. Like everyone's got yeah. a deal, but we do that all the time. Yeah. And no, no. I just want there to be a rubric. I just want there to be a principle, someone to give some thought into what a principled rationale would be. Because it's not clear to me that following either like worst case scenario out down the road, it's not so clear to me, and maybe you can help me clarify it, but it's not so mm. clear to me that one outcome is necessarily resulting in more tragedy than the mm. other. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it does seem clear to me that leaving, you know, Putin to take over Ukraine or install a puppet government and, and you know, kind of carry out retribution against Ukrainian politicians and what that would mean for Ukraine's democracy, what it would mean for surrounding countries, then being faced with potentially millions of Ukrainian refugees. But the alternative is what? As going, as putting troops on the ground and fighting a proxy, it's not a proxy war because it's Russia and yeah. it's us in Ukraine. Right. Right? No, I, I think that is obviously horrible in its own right, but I don't think we're talking about that. I mean, I think so Biden has made it clear. I think, again, the goal here is to make clear to Putin that this is going to be much more costly if he moves forward than he might think. That has been the goal all along. So I what is that, the threat? I mean, the, the threat is that Ukrainians are going are, you know, should he try to invade the rest of Ukraine, that Ukrainians are, you know, equipped to make that very painful. Um, and again, so I don't, the I'm, not, war. I'm not saying that. Well, you know, you yes, certainly. Are, we're, are we're, Ukrainians we're, really? If we give some non-lethal aid, whatever that is, yeah. are we really are we are we really of the belief? Is it is it true that Ukrainians are going to be able to withstand these one hundred and seventy thousand? No, no, they're Russian not. Troops? They're not going to withstand it. They they're the option is how painful will they make it? And again, even saying these words, I, I mean, God, like the, 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 the like the, the the death and suffering that's contained in the analysis here. I don't want to diminish it. It gives me enormous. Um, pain and i'll just i'll just you know say as some of your listeners may know like my, my family is ukrainian my dad and mm. his parents are ukrainian refugees mm. um so you know and i have family there so you know trying to provide this kind of you know semi-dispassionate analysis is a challenge but i just want to kind of own up to that well have you been do you have is it close family that you you speak with do you have any insight into you know how they're we, you know we're in touch from this? from time to time we haven't spoken in a while um it's it's a great aunt uh, she does not speak mm. English, but it was from mm. my father's extended family who were separated during the war, and we've been mm. in touch subsequently. So, you know, just getting back to your question of, yeah, I mean, I think both of, there's ways to see both of these different, you know, the different outcomes. There's a lot of suffering either way. 
Um, but I think the focus for now is to try to avert, um, you know, the, the worst outcome while still recognizing that Putin does have, as I said earlier, really like escalation dominance, you know, even if we're talking about uh, sanctions uh, that cut too hard in the in, into the Russian economy, you know, he he's made clear that they have a whole bunch of cyber options. They've certainly invested a lot of money in their ability to respond uh, through cyber war and other things like that. So it's it's very easy to see how this this escalates out of control. Um, but you know, in general, I think the Biden administration has been has been proceeding cautiously. Um, and trying to avert this. And again, I, I, I think, you know, I've certainly been critical of them where they've come up short. And there's quite a few examples uh, I, I could give where I think they've come up short on some of uh, progressives goals. Um, but, you know, I, I think they do deserve some credit for for managing a very, very tough situation uh, fairly well here. And I'll just want to say one other thing. I'm sorry, go ahead. Please. No, no, no I, I think also what you said about, you know, the, the questions about what, how is America justified to intervene or do anything here or anywhere else? I don't, I don't dismiss that at all. I think that is a very valid question. And I also think um, the debates that we are having on the left right now are very, very important. I think we are, there's some real like vigorous and, and robust debate about the validity and uses of American power about what does a good American foreign policy actually actually look like um, that are, I think, more interesting and more robust than they have been probably in my lifetime. And that is very exciting to me because I think progressives across the board are getting and using power in this country in a way that they have not in a long time. And so that's why I want to make sure that as I engage in this debate, um, I want to do so in a way that that builds the left, that that is constructive and respectful, because the right's goal is to divide the left and we should not help them. Yes. Well, I certainly hope I, I've heard a lot of folks whom I like on both sides of this yeah. question, yeah. you know, being kind of dismissive and, you know, calling each other stupid and, mm -hmm. you know, Putin puppets and all of this kind of right. thing on both going both ways. Right. Uh, you know, you're an imperialist, you're a poon puppet. Okay. Like, and I really hope that some members of those factions will come on the podcast and talk to each other because, you know, someone like me, like I, a lot of folks, most folks are just trying to understand and evaluate. And yeah. it's difficult to have a conversation about where each side is coming from if instead of making arguments, everyone's just calling each other stupid and captured right. and all of these other kinds of things. So right. hopefully this is just the beginning of all of those conversations. You know, tonight after folks listen to this, you can join us on my call-in show to give feedback and to weigh in. And hopefully we'll have some broader members of the left community joining for that conversation. Thank you so much, Matt, for joining us here today. You're you're not, you know, a, a podcaster or a journalist or anything like that, but go ahead and tell our listeners where they can they can find you and your quote unquote work. Uh, well, you can find me uh, tweeting too much at Matt Duss. <laughs> um, um, other than that, you know, just, you know, see you around. Thank you very much, Brianna. I really enjoyed this. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate it. I really do. And to all of our listeners, as always, keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.